from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Coming up today, out of the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Caitlin McCulloch will offer this week's insight on the cattle markets. She'll comment on the rise of beef grading prime and how that resonates in overall beef demand. And she'll preview this Friday's USDA cattle inventory report. Then K-State's Greg Hanselcheck will talk about reevaluating your fly control program for your cattle herd here in midsummer, and the additional steps you producers can take as the effectiveness of the earlier control approaches starts to fade. And State 4-H leader Wade Weber of K-State joins Jeff Wickman on this week's 4-H segment. All that and more straight ahead on Agriculture Today. Make hand washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome once again to Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. We'll open up with our cattle market segment for the week, as we typically do on a Monday. And along with us this time is the director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center out in Denver, talking once more with Caitlin McCulloch. Caitlin, let's begin by looking back at last week's trade, as we normally do, and There seems to be some renewed energy in particularly the futures markets, live and feeder cattle trades. What's behind that enthusiasm in the market? Well, you're right, Eric. Last week, end of the week, on a positive note, feeder cattle uh, showed some very strong numbers on the futures board with most of the contracts in the green. And fed cattle rose again, too, on Friday as well. I think the renewed interest in the feeder cattle market has to do with looking at what potentially feed costs are going to be, as well as some of that optimism in the fed cattle market. If you look at where break-evens might be, if you plan on feeding these cattle for, let's say, the normal amount of time that we're through the backlog by the time they're ready to be marketed, it looks to us like you can pencil in something above break-even. I mean, maybe not a substantial margin, but things are definitely looking more promising. And I think that's that's boosted these feeder cattle prices and are leading that that market higher at this point. And in fact, you say that you're noting a resurgence in the weekly receipts of feeder cattle moving through the auction barns as of the month of June. You might speak to that. So during the pandemic, we saw total weekly receipts, which is a report released by USDA AMS. It's a voluntary report, but we really saw those numbers compressed significantly as both buyers and sellers do not want to go to auction barns. And the last two weeks of May picked up significantly, particularly in auction traffic. And by the month of June, we were seeing significant year-over-year growth. So on a monthly basis, auction receipts in June were up about 12%. And you can see that trend with the other types of receipts that are reported. So this report includes auction barns, direct sales, as well as internet or video transactions as well. And you can see those other categories, those have increased as well. So direct sales in June were up. 39% for the month, and then video auctions were up about 4%. So overall total receipts for the month of June were up over 15%. And would you anticipate when the next round of numbers on that movement come through, we'll see a continuation of, of that kind of flow, Caitlin? So the early numbers that have been reported for July, so this is released weekly, um, 4th of July obviously is a, a slower week just because of the holiday The week ending July 10th doesn't necessarily show anything out of the ordinary. It doesn't necessarily show, though, the high volumes you saw in the first part of June either. So I think the jury's still out kind of what July is going to do. But I would expect, just based on these receipts data, that probably placements on the cattle on feed report that's going to come out on the 24th are going to show a year-over-year increase. And there's some other factors feeding into that as well. But it looks to me like feedlots are working on filling those pens to full capacity, especially now that the market seems like it's turned to be a possibly a profitable one uh, for when these future marketings may occur. 
Want to bring up something else that you have on the LMIC.info website lately. You put together an article looking at beef trade itself and the fact that we see a larger volume of carcasses grading prime. What's that about? And you might then talk about the significance of this to the beef demand side of things. We have a couple influences that are at play here when we talk about quality grades and fed cattle. So some of the longer term influences are going to be the genetic gains that have been going on for decades. So the emphasis on greater marbling and enhanced eating experience for the consumer. That has steadily pushed more cattle towards upper choice and prime categories over several, several years. The other thing that we're seeing is that in general, day dress weights have increased as well as days on feed. Um, and that's helped elevate the number of carcasses graining at those levels. But more short term, when coronavirus hit the U.S., um, more cattle ended up on feed. And we've, we've dramatically increased those days on feed in a relatively short period of time. So when we think about genetic potential and the number of cattle that could potentially grade at a higher level, given more days on feed, we're seeing more of those come through the system and grade prime. Just for some comparisons, last year, fed carcasses um, presented for grading seven, about 7% graded prime in June last year, compared to over 10.5% this year. So that's a very big increase compared to where we've been last year. And if you look at the five-year time frame in 2015 and 16, we were closer to only 5%. So we've seen a dramatic change over a very short window of time where that percent grading prime has, has really increased in the last couple of years. One of the factors that's come into play here because of the higher volume of prime is that it's, it's collapsed those premiums relative to other, to other quality cuts. So what happened this spring was when we have the slaughter capacity significantly drop because of the closures at the slaughter level, all of the quality grades moved up because there was just generally less beef. But then in addition to that, we've seen the prime versus branded and prime versus choice premium collapse further in part because there's a higher volume of prime. Now, to your point, Eric, what does that mean for prime beef on the consumer level? And I think there's a couple of things to think about. Number one, are consumers willing to pay a premium for that beef. I think that ultimately depends on how they're feeling financially and if that's something that they're willing to spend additional money on. I also think Prime is still very much a white tablecloth product and the amount of retailers offering it is still small relative to how many offer choice or some other options. And so Prime might face some headwinds just in the sense that we're still seeing the consumer hesitant to enter back into those restaurants And from a financial perspective, they may be hesitant to go to those upper end, either cuts in the grocery store or potentially upper end restaurants that would offer something like a prime heavy type of menu. And so those two are going to limit, those two factors are really going to limit any upward potential of that prime premium relative to some of the other qualities, but also that additional supply, I think is also a limiting factor. So you have supply and demand kind of working against that premium especially when you talk about it relative to some of the other quality premiums. It's a very interesting facet of what's going on in the beef trade currently. Uh, By the way, you can read more about that at LMIC.info. Well, we do have, as you said, a cattle on feed report coming out this coming Friday. But we also, Caitlin, have the semi-annual cattle inventory report, same day. The one in January tends to get all the fanfare, but these mid-year numbers certainly lend a little more information to the markets as well. And LMIC has put out its projections for that inventory. So the July 1 report is beneficial in several ways. For one thing, it tells us it's a little bit smaller of a sample size, which is possibly why it doesn't get as much fanfare. But it's our first look at the calf crop and what we can see happened um, this spring. And it also gives us an idea of heifer retention on both the beef and dairy side. And so it's, it's a critical report to, to have before your January 1 uh, number next year. And I'll say that with all the uncertainty this year, 
the July one numbers are somewhat difficult to predict in that a lot of your relationships are not going to be the same as they would be in a normal year. And in part because we, of the number of cattle we have backed up on feed. So you should probably are going to see some higher numbers than a calf crop would imply on those steers over 500 pounds and those other heifers. Those would be where those backlog animals would fall. But in addition, when we look at cow slaughter and how that's going to relate to how many female animals we have in the herd, those two were affected by slaughter plant closures. So the report can have a different meaning than maybe it would in a normal year, if that makes sense. So normally we would say if beef cow slaughter is up, we probably would see a significant reduction in the number of beef cows. When I look at what slaughter did compared to a year ago, those changes were probably pretty similar. And so I I am expecting the beef cow herd to be slightly smaller than a year ago, but some of that might just be timing in the sense that, yes, we're probably still contracting, but we might see more further liquidation in the second half of the year simply because of those closures. Drought is probably going to be a factor. And so the July one number could be hiding some of that, if you will. So one of the keys to remember in this cattle inventory report coming up is that the number of backlogged animals could in fact skew the total number of cattle and calves over a year ago, even if we're still in a contractionary phase for the beef cow herd. Well, the disruptions of the pandemic have uh, cast everything into a, a bit of a different light. So we'll see what those numbers look like when the USDA releases them this coming Friday. Not only the cattle inventory report, but the monthly cattle on feed report. Caitlin, thanks as always for the observations, and we will talk again in a few weeks. We always appreciate your time. Thank you. She's the director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Caitlin McCulloch. Have a look at their website, which is kept fresh with good information on the trades at lmic.info. We'll return with more. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. Agriculture Today continues on the K-State Radio Network, and it's our occasion once again to visit with the director of the Production Animal Field Investigations Unit at the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory here at K-State. Greg Hanselcheck has stopped by for another chat about bovine health management. And Greg, we're tying this session into something that has emerged in Kansas in recent weeks, and it's afflicting principally horses, but it can also be transmitted to cattle and other livestock. Vesicular stomatitis virus, or VSV, and it is associated with flies, as they might be the vectors. So we're going to revisit fly control today. Again, this is prompted by concerns over VSV. Are you hearing about that within the laboratory? We are. We're, we're doing quite a bit of testing for VSV, and, and you're right, it's exploded in, in Kansas. And we do know that the primary flies that carry VSV are a little bit different than the ones that we know are economically important to our, our cow-calf herds. Those flies that are carriers of VSV are are more like our stable flies that are economically important to cow-calf operations is we don't really have good control over those. So today we probably just want to talk about the three major flies because we are getting into the, the peak season of especially face flies in, in uh, cows on pasture. Before we move on to those, though, the three main carriers of VSV, black flies, sand flies, and the midges, and we really don't have effective direct means of control for those? No, because especially the midges are probably the one that are the primary carriers or the ones that are most involved. And they, they lay their eggs around the, in the muddy areas around ponds and where there's lots of moisture. There are some products out there for other flies that can be put on there. But economically, there's no way to reduce those numbers. We certainly can't stop cattle from uh, wading into the ponds to drink. So that's more of an environmental thing than it is actually a, a practical fly control problem. 
But if one keeps up their regular fly control campaign against those flies that we commonly see in cattle herds, maybe some spillover effect for those other flies at all? Well, there are some there are some things that we'll talk about the sprays and, and the mists and those kind of things that that have good control over flies other than our horn flies and our face flies. So yeah, there's probably some carryover depending on what method we use to to control flies. We will get to those, but when we talk about flies in cattle, there are three principal types that typically bring on the most pressure. Absolutely, and for cow calf operators, it's face flies horn flies and stable flies and they're all a little bit different the face fly is the one that feeds around the eyes the horn fly is a blood feeder that feeds on the back and then the stable flies are the ones that we see they're primary on the front legs of cattle and calves and so when we see our 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 herds in in the corners during the day in the pasture season and they're all they're kind of dancing a lot of that is because those stable flies are taking blood meals off those front legs so they're they're three very important flies, but they're a little bit different in what they do and where they feed. Now, virtually all producers took measures before turnout onto pasture to protect their stock against these flies. And why we talk of it again today is some of those measures may be running out of steam, to put it that way. Absolutely. I mean, we we promote the ear tags, insecticide ear tags, are are very, very effective, especially against uh, our home flies and they can be against our face flies but they last about three to five weeks so if we put those tags in those animals as we went to pasture we're getting towards the the end of the life of those tags and that helps explain why july and august are our peak months for face fly issues in, in pastures in cattle the problem with retagging is well there may be many but one of them would be it's not the most convenient thing to round up and go at it again no it's not and there aren't there aren't many producers that are willing to do that and we probably would only recommend that if there were some major major fly and or eye issues in the herd that and we don't have any other way to control those flies a, a retag might be necessary well before we leave the subject of the tags you say there's a new complementary product that can be used as an add-on if you will to fly control via ear tags some sort of a, a strip that can be attached under the back of the ear yes there's a there's a couple ear tag companies at least for a couple of their products that uh, not only have an ear tag but they have what's called a strip and it it basically goes on the back side where the where the button is in addition to the ear tag and some really good research out of uh, Nebraska has shown that the combination does a really good job, 80 to 85 percent, if I remember the numbers correctly, uh, reduction in, in fly numbers, horn flies in particular, by using a combination of both the tag and the strip. So if you're having problems, that may be something to think about. So look into that option. But once again, retagging is a little lacking for practicality. So other methods of control should be considered. And dust bags are certainly one of those. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of producers use dust bags. The, the downside of dust bags are, number one, the number of products that we have available to put in those uh, contraptions is is limited. And then to really get good control, meaning more than about 20, 25 percent reduction in flight, we're going to have to figure out a way to force the animals to use those on a daily basis. So it's going to have to be some type of a lane to water or to feed or something to, to force them through those underneath those dust bags. And the same you say is true of using oilers? Oilers are the same way. Again, limited on the number of products we can put in there and, again, force make those animals use those oilers every day. The other thing I want to warn producers is the liquid that we put in there a lot of times is, is something like diesel, which is fine, but please do not use old motor oil because now we're running into other health issues that that could occur. There are some toxicity concerns with that waste oil, you say? There is. There can be some lead buildup in the oil, and we can have some, some major, major issues. So stay away from used motor oil if you're going to use the, the back rubbers. That's an important point to know here. Other means... Various sprays that can be applied. Yes, there's uh, there's lots of products that we can spray. The limitation there is uh, how do we how do we do it in a pasture situation, which can be done. But the other thing is these products don't last very long, and some of them are labeled for every day, some of them every few days, certainly once a week. So 
it's more of a labor and practicality thing if we're talking about sprays. Porons, same notation? Porons are, are, can be very effective, especially against horn flies. You remember, horn flies spend most of their time on the animal, so when we put that poron on, they're going to be exposed to that insecticide. So everybody knows we've got lots of products for that. They're going to last about three weeks duration, so uh, might get you through into the freezing time of the year. But they're, they're good products out there for that. While we're thinking of alternatives here, might mention one more. The, the larvicidal products and those insect growth regulators, those have uh, proven to be pretty effective over the years. But uh, the timing is the issue right now, you say? Absolutely. There are some, some of those products are very, very effective. But again, they're, they're labeled and, and the biology of them is that they should be started about 30 days before the fly season. And then we want to make sure that we continue uh, those products in the mineral all the way until we have a hard frost. The other thing is consumption. There's got to be continuous consumption, so we that's an issue with those products. Again, they're not they're not effective against stable flies. They they would be against horn and face, but it's probably not economically wise to start at this time of year putting those products in the mineral. Well, tell us more about something else that you say is catching on with cow calf producers. Certain mist treatments, what are these about? Yeah, so uh, dairies and feedlots for a long time have uh, had these these misters, these blowers that they either put in uh, side-by-sides or, or pickups, and it just it, it's a fine mist that they blow on the animals. And there are more and more cow-calf operators that are, are having those uh, things installed in the back of their pickup. They drive out in the pasture when the animals are bunched up. Very effective, and they can be effective against the the stable flies, probably against the midges and the those other flies that we know carry VSV2. Again, the downside is they don't last very long, so it's it's going to have to be a frequent administration, but it may be something that producers think about in the future. One other option here we want to mention as we visit today, it's called the VET gun, and it's a treatment that's been tested out through university trials likewise, you say? Yes, uh, Nebraska did the vet gun, and that's the CO2-charged gun that shoots like a paintball that's got insecticide in there. University of Nebraska did some really good research, and they showed that get up to 80 85% reduction in the, in the number of especially horn flies. The first treatment, and that, that lasted about four weeks. And then when they went back and readministered that product, they got another three weeks uh, duration on it. So it can be effective, and it's uh, probably worthwhile using in some cases. So some possibilities there, but the point, Greg, is producers need to understand that it might be time to bolster their fly control one more time to get them through the balance of the grazing season because the fly pressure won't let up for a while. Absolutely, and that's, and that's just... It's nobody's fault. It's just all these products, expect, especially our ear tags, they can only last so long. So we're getting to the time of the year where that the, the amount of insecticide in there is at a low level. And so it may be time to think about alternative fly control because the flies are going to continue to be a problem until we get a hard freeze. Yeah, and that'll be quite a while down the road, it appears. Timely information. Thanks for coming over and sharing it with us here, Greg. Greg Hanselcheck is from the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory at Kansas State University. We'll be back with more. This is Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. This is the K-State Radio Network, and you're listening to Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And on we go now to today's agricultural news headlines. These courtesy in part of DTN. 
The Heritage Foundation think tank is urging lawmakers now to oppose the proposal to raise the spending limit for the Commodity Credit Corporation to $68 billion, up from the current $30 billion cap. That group is also taking aim at other provisions in the House-passed relief bill that allow payments from CCC to be used for additional payments, including aid to agricultural processing plans to ensure supply chain continuity during an emergency period. The CCC borrowing increase is not included in the pending House-passed COVID-19 relief package, which would only replenish CCC's borrowing authority to the $30 billion cap. Now, Heritage is arguing that expanding the CCC's spending authority would allow Congress to, quoting here, avoid making important choices, such as which agricultural commodities would be eligible for payments, which geographic regions would be covered, whether there should be payment limits, and about almost every detail of any future handout program. We may import more beef than we export this year, according to one USDA economist. More on that from the USDA's Gary Crawford. The U.S. is expected to rack up a huge trade surplus in red meats this year. USDA's latest forecast is for 10.4 billion pounds of exports, 4.1 billion pounds of imports, mainly because of surging pork shipments of more than 7.5 billion pounds, projected imports only 851 million. For beef, though, looks like we'll import more than we export. Exports projected down slightly from last year to 2.9 billion pounds, imports rising to just over 3 billion. USDA economist Bart Kenner told us that for the first eight months of the fiscal year, October through May, while pork imports were down 9 percent. Beef and veal are up 11 percent from the previous year. For obvious reasons. We did have troubles with not being able to operate processing facilities at full capacity, and it would make sense that we need to bring more in from outside our borders. But USDA is forecasting a turnaround next year and a beef trade surplus. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now, as Gary said, the USDA is expecting pork exports to increase both this year and next year. Stephanie Ho takes a closer look at that. What did USDA's latest reports have to say about the meat trade? We are expecting to see a higher level of pork exports. That was USDA Chief Economist Rob Johansson. We know that African swine fever continues to decimate the uh, Asian pig herds, so there is quite a bit of demand for pork both in China as well as other Asian countries. So we've increased our 2020 export estimate by 325 million pounds to 7.5 billion pounds. And for next year? We're increasing also our 2021 export estimate by 350 million pounds to 7.65 billion pounds. That would be up 127 million pounds year to year. World Ag Outlook Board Chair Mark Jekinowski gives another reason for expected strong pork exports. That just uh, reflects strong demand from many countries, and also the fact that our prices are pretty low, so that makes us pretty competitive. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Boston Market Corporation has filed a federal lawsuit now against a group of poultry companies alleging the companies conspired to manipulate the price of broilers from 2008 to 2017, costing the restaurant chain hundreds of millions of dollars in overcharges. This lawsuit is in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Illinois in Rockford. It follows the June grand jury indictment in Denver of several executives of various poultry companies. Those executives were charged with conspiring to fix prices and rig bids for broiler chickens. Broilers, of course, raised for human consumption, sold to grocers and restaurants. This new lawsuit alleges the conspiracy included plaintiffs Tyson Foods, Pilgrim's Pride, Purdue Farms, Coke Foods, Foster Farms, and Claxton Poultry, among numerous others. The next hearing in the case is scheduled for August the 8th. Boston Market has asked for a jury trial. In its complaint, Boston Market alleged the companies conspire to restrain production, manipulate price indices, fix prices, and rig bids, the purpose and effect of which was to fix, raise, and stabilize and maintain prices of chicken meat throughout the United States, according to the complaint as it read. Boston Market said it contracted directly with the companies to purchase broilers, submitting bid requests from them to supply its restaurants across the country. 
They went on to say that as a result of the defendants' small bird price fixing and bid rigging conspiracy, as they put it, defendants were able to exact significant price increases from Boston Market and other restaurants. At the same time, wholesale prices of small bird broilers were decreasing, as the lawsuit alleges. The purchase orders for broilers supplied to Boston Market restaurants were issued from locations in a number of states, including Kansas and Nebraska. And your farm service agency here in Kansas has been closely tracking drought conditions statewide in anticipation of providing needed assistance to you livestock producers impacted by drought. Ranchers and livestock operators in some counties may now have two different programs through which they can request assistance from the FSA, the Livestock Forage Disaster Program, or LFP, and the Conservation Reserve Program, Emergency Harvesting and Grazing. Now, under the LFP, producers in several Kansas counties are eligible to apply for benefits on native and improved pasture land with permanent vegetative cover or certain crops planted specifically for grazing. The LFP provides compensation to eligible producers who suffer grazing losses for covered livestock due to the drought on privately owned or cash leased land or federally managed land. Eligible producers must complete the proper form and the required supporting documentation no later than next February for 2020 losses. Now, certain Kansas CRP practices may be harvested or grazed outside the primary nesting season in counties that have reached at least the D2 drought status on the U.S. drought monitor. That emergency grazing available on all CRP practices, grazing will be limited to a maximum of 90 days or September the 30th of 2020, or when the cover reaches the minimum height requirement as stated in the CRP grazing plan. The CRP must be left 25% ungrazed or grazed at no more than and 75% of the established stocking rate. And emergency haying is available on all CRP practices, except for certain practices in counties also approved for the LFP. If you'd like to know more about those options on utilizing those resources in an emergency drought situation, of course, contact the good folks at your local USDA service center. They can fill you in on all the particulars. We'll be back with more shortly. You're listening to Agriculture Today. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. Welcome back and thanks for joining us on Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. A survey commissioned by the National 4-H Council found that more than 7 in 10 kids between the ages of 13 and 19 are struggling with their mental health. The survey was conducted May 4th through the 14th by the Harris Poll. There were 234 age members among the more than 1,500 respondents. Kansas 4-H state leader Wade Weber says the survey takes a temperature of what youth are talking about today. Wade, you were mentioning to me earlier that this is kind of a sobering but important document because it really does give an insight as to how teenagers feel right now. Absolutely. We're thankful that National 4-H Council has partnered with Harris Polling to really take a temperature, you might say, of the mental health responses uh, of young people. We know that mental health concerns are a significant aspects of human development, especially adolescent development. And the state of the adolescent mental health in our country uh, is of special importance to us in the youth development field. Obviously, with the challenges that are associated with the COVID-19 and many of the other conversations that are happening across our country about trauma and stress. It's a really important topic for us to be aware of as we think about providing those necessary supports and encouragement and context for young people to thrive and ultimately to find that sense of purpose and place and really channel their energies and growth in a way that enables them to be uh, full-fledged members and community partners as they go forward. Specifically, the Harris Poll was asking them questions about their mental health uh, and how it relates to the issues surrounding COVID-19 and what are the ways in which they are asking the question, do they see themselves as resilient or not as they approach those things? 
And the survey is showing that they want that interaction with older adults and with their peers. Absolutely. And when we think about what are recommendations for whether you're a volunteer, whether you're a a youth serving organization, whether you're a professional or whether you're a parent or a a grandparent or just a community member who cares about the well-being of young people, it's really about giving yourself space to reflect because in a time of disruption and uncertainty and not knowing for sure what tomorrow is going to hold, programs that continue to have to be adapted or shifted or changed. It's so very important for us as professionals, as the adults in young people's lives to model that pause, to kind of gather your feelings, gather your connection, you know, put down the phone for a second, take a walk, exercise, those types of things in order just to really allow the brain to re-engage in the creative, thoughtful, adaptive, problem-solving aspects of it. But when you're, you're hit from all sides all the time, it's very, very difficult for us as humans to, to respond appropriately. And so I think that's one of the key things I would encourage people to do. The other one would be to gather together, and I've heard of many of our 4-H agents doing this with some of our volunteers. And to those who haven't done it, I'd encourage you to start connecting with their volunteers on a weekly or every other week kind of basis to check in, to touch base with folks, encouraging them to continue to look for ways to write, you know, old-fashioned letters, you know, making, sending an email to young people, connecting in ways that they can continue to encourage project-based learning, the opportunity to have a plan, you know, to pursue things in, in such a way that says, as I go through the day, what are the things that I can learn? What are the things that I can do? And then how can I connect with others? And then along the way, also having the ability to cultivate a relationship that allows you to connect with another person, I think is really, really key. One of the things that I would encourage along the way is just the ability to be patient, to be purposeful, and to be persistent. Because you can't just turn around and say to a young person in that developmental relationship, like, all right, dad's got 30 minutes. What's going on? That's usually not the recipe for authentic conversation and sharing. But If you can't give that 30 minutes, be with them, try and connect into their world, see the world through their eyes, the ability to empathize, not necessarily solve it, but just to empathize and acknowledge is a key first step in helping that connection to form. And as you are persistent in that, the opportunity for young people to build that trust and make that connection, I'm confident will will emerge. One of the things I found interesting was the fact that As part of the executive summary, they talked about the fact that ultimately teens are calling for major change in mental health conversation, and that's really what needs to take place is we have to have those conversations. I know that's something that 4-H is working on very heavily right now, but it really starts with the active listening and the conversation. Absolutely, and I think it starts first with that curiosity in the other person and the ability to say, help me understand and know and connect with you. And I think that's a really key component in building a resilient young person as well as resilient support systems as well. I mean, we as adults need those things as well. We need somebody who understands us, somebody who we can let our guard down and be authentic with and enable us to contextualize and and maybe even reframe the situation of things that are going on in front of us. But I I am so very encouraged that from those findings, when it turns around and says that 65% of teens want their family to talk more with them about their own mental health and how they're problem solving and engaging with challenges. That's the thing that I've been really encouraged by is that there is a demand. You know, young people want to talk more, to connect more. We still know that the significant influencers in young people's lives are the investment and modeling of a caring adult who's interested in them, who's interested in their well-being and helping them continue to move forward to grow and be successful and growing in responsibilities and seeing their work mean something. Those are the types of things that um, we continue to pursue within the 4-H program as well as other youth-serving organizations, ultimately to help young people build those skills that are going to help them for a lifetime. And in a lot of respects, I'm so very encouraged at the ways in which our young people are are being adaptive, thinking of creative ways to pursue the same missional objective in creative ways. In a lot of respects, this incubator that we're in right now here in 2020 is, is a great catalyst for young people. Build some skills that, quite frankly, generations before didn't have to deal with. 
to the same degree. And I've been so proud of those resilient teens who are continuing to be innovative, creative, and in some respects, model to the adults what it means to be adaptive, to be creative, to be intentional, to be with their peers as well as the other members of their community. And so there's a lot of great assets to continue to build upon and to champion as we go forward. And what I think our study is really revealing is we've learned so much, and yet the opportunities continue to be in front of us to continue to expand that circle of resiliency to more and more young people to really equip them to have a a great and healthy posture as they enter into these next days. That's Kansas 4-H state leader Wade Weber with thoughts on the National 4-H Council survey on the state of teen mental health. The full report is online at 4-H.org. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.